Okay. Hi, everybody. I make that the hour. Um, and so uh, on that note, we'll make a start. Neha, can I just double check that you can hear me? Make sure my... Um, yes, so it's loud and clear. Excellent. That's a good start. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. It's great to see uh, such a large turnout um, from, the, from the, the validator community. Thanks all for your attention throughout the process towards goal standard for the global goals. Um, I'm going to present for somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes this morning. Um, it's a, a more high level pre presentation about the standard and the new requirements for validation and verification bodies, VVBs. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about where you can find that information and what else uh, is coming forward shortly. Um, so in terms of housekeeping for this webinar, I'm not sure how many of you have used GoToWebinar before, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You should have a control panel. Um, I'll take questions at the end of the presentation. It's a little easier uh, to manage the flow that way. And you can do that in two ways. You can either um, uh, drop a question into the questions section there. Um, so I see Robert already has uh, dropped a few comments. Um, you can drop questions straight into there, and I'll read those out and respond to them at the same time. Uh, or you should see a little hands up button as well. And if you put your hand up, uh, I can unmute you, um, and uh, and you can and you can ask your question. And I can respond that way. Uh, it works pretty well actually using the questions box. So do feel free to use that. But I would ask. Uh, if you can try and be really clear with the question, no shorthand, it, it gets a little bit tricky to interpret otherwise. Um, if you think of a question after the call or you don't feel comfortable asking it on this call, that's totally fine. You can drop it to help at goldstandard.org or indeed to myself or Neha, who I think most of you will know uh, and have the contact details for um, anyway. So as I say, I'll probably speak for around 20 to 30 minutes um, and then we'll have uh, around 45 minutes to an hour for Q&A uh, we can run on a little bit if the if the conversation needs to. Uh, you may be aware as well. There's another um, uh, VVB's webinar uh, this evening, GMT, uh, for for a different time zone. So uh, we'll be recording that one as well, and you can listen back to either or both um, if you want to hear what other uh, other colleagues are saying at other VVB's. That's totally fine too. Um, so as I say, this presentation is really a, a higher level one about gold standard for global goals, the background, the changes, and the implications for VVB's. In a few weeks' time, you've probably already seen the invite where we'll do a more detailed training session. So today isn't really to get into uh, the real detail of um, the, the new standard. So uh, I'm happy to, to field technical questions if, if we need to. But um, if you have a more technical question or an interpretation of a rule that you've seen, it's probably best to deal with that via help at goldstandard.org. Uh, today is really about you know, principles and, and key clarifications and the role of VVBs in the new standard. Um, and obviously, we can deal with the more technical stuff uh, separately. Uh, so with that, I'll dive right in. So um, before I show this presentation, actually, this presentation and an accompanying video is shortly going to be posted to the Gold Standard website. Uh, the first part of the presentation really goes into some of the background of why and how we've developed um, GS for the global goals. Uh, for the sake of time this morning, I'm going to skip through some of that, and you can watch that back on the website later. I think many of you will have followed pretty closely uh, the development. So I don't want to waste everybody's time by going over history here. Um, before I do the presentation, just quickly to show you, hopefully you can still see my screen. If you go to the gold standard website and look under the hour standard section, if you can see my cursor and drop down to standard documents, you'll be taken to the new microsite. I'm sure many of you have already taken a look at that. Uh, it'll take a little while to open apparently. Just give that a second. Yep. Um, and then within here, you can see the, the, the drop down menus on the left, standard documents, if you go to principles and requirements and then assurance, you'll see the new requirements for ver validation and verification bodies. And that really is the detail of what I'll talk about today. So I'll, I'll give an overview of this. Uh, but if you haven't already read this, then this is the most important document uh, for you to take away. I'll just quickly drop the link to that into the chat box of um of the webinar here uh, so that you can follow that. Uh, also on the, the website, if you look at the left-hand menu, you can see the fee section as well, which will explain some of the fees associated with becoming an eligible VVB. Uh, and I'll obviously leave you to read that in your own time. Um, we will circulate this presentation, which I'm recording today, uh, along with some notes. And obviously I'll put the links to those two documents within the, uh, within the uh, email that gets circulated. So no worries about taking notes on that right now. Um, and with that, I'll dive right into the presentation. So welcome to Gold Standard for the Global Goals. Uh, many of you will know Gold Standard uh, for quite a long time. Uh, I'd like to think uh, that this new standard is really an evolution uh, of what we've always done. 
Um, so very much still focused on being the highest quality, the best that can be achieved within carbon markets. Uh, very much still focused on stakeholder inclusivity, strong safeguards and contributions to sustainable development on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, very much focused on uh, robust monitoring, reporting and verification. Uh, and obviously that's where you guys uh, you guys really come in. Um, the, the new standard is... Um, uh, really a, a kind of function of the the response or the gold standard response to the Paris Agreement uh, and the role that we still see for carbon markets there. Um, we very much see that although carbon markets will will certainly need to change in the um, in the coming years to 2020, we still very much see them as having a, a major role in delivering on the Paris Agreement commitments. Uh, we're actually going to be working on some of those uncertainties in policy in the coming months. And, and so do look out for consultations around additionality, for example, uh, the interpretation of NDC's baselines uh, over the coming months and years. Uh, we're really hoping to take a, a kind of leading role in terms of how the carbon market can react to those things. Um, clearly, we've uh, not got all the answers ourselves, but um, what's becoming clear, I think, at policy level is uh, that the standards, I think, need to take a more leading role. Uh, and certainly gold standard will, will sort of set forth on that shortly. Um, we also react to the sustainable development goals, which, if anything, to gold standard is the more exciting uh, aspect for us. It's very much speaking to our history, combining with the the, the climate security element of our vision. Um, we uh, inevitably, I suppose, you know, the astute amongst you will have already considered that gold standard needed to update, given that version two point two is based on the Kyoto Protocol and the Millennium Development Goals. Um, so there was an ine inevitability about our update. Uh, but critically, we really wanted to unify the standard uh, around the SDGs and around the Paris Agreement so that we can speak a common language about what gold standard is and means. Um, so right now, we, you know, we have a, a forestry standard and an energy standard, for example. Um, although those two things contain very common elements uh, between them, they don't do them in exactly the same way. And so we have a kind of you know, disparity or an inconsistency across what gold standard means to different users. That's something we've really taken care of with gs for gg as well as uh, um, building it off the sustainable development goals. Um, we really, as, as time progresses as well, you know, we, we're thinking about risks and particularly trade-offs. Now, trade-offs is a, is a tricky topic, uh, but one that will become more and more pre prevalent over the coming years, particularly as projects scale up, which is what we hope to do with uh, GS for GG as we focus on corporate reporting and fund reporting as well as carbon markets in a traditional sense. Um, so there's there's uh, some initial foray into how to manage trade-offs and unusual trade-offs, uh, but you'll see in the coming years that will develop more and more at things like the cities level, the landscapes level, or or fund level, for example. So very excited to watch that develop as well. Uh, this is really for the future. Um, one of the um, the exciting aspects of uh, of GS for GG in, in unifying is it also allows us to start to build a consistent language on the value of um, of, of certified impacts. Uh, so one thing that's been tricky to do historically, you may have seen on our website that we've we've had a kind of initial study a couple of years ago on the economic value of the sustainable development co benefits. Uh, we're really looking to um, develop on that and actually create a system in the coming years that allows us to put that that economic value and make it more uh, practical to assess. Um, now, you know, I'm sure many of you will know how hard that is to do, uh, but it's our ambition, I think, under GS for GG to move in that direction as well. Um, so very excited to watch that come forward. Um, so just a, a brief note to say, uh, well, to thank, but also to draw attention to some of our strategic partners that have really added credibility here. I think... The list of names on this slide, the UN, uh, the World Bank, WWF, CDP, uh, and the uh, GACC, um, you know, really speaks to the quality of partner and, and support that Gold Standard has attracted through this process. Um, I mean, it doesn't come much more credible, really, than the World Bank and the, and the UNFCCC. So very excited and grateful for those partnerships. Um, each of those is really uh, pushing forward on a number of agendas. And again, you'll see more and more consultations. You may have, may have recently seen our UNFCCC collaboration uh, consultation. Um, so really speaking, I think, to the, uh, the credibility and the interest that we've, uh, we've generated with this standard. Uh, so what, this is the most interesting bit for you guys, I think, in terms of what the standard really brings. So the gold standard uh, for the global goals is very much considered next generation. Um, so as I said earlier, we really wanted to unify our three existing scopes, water, land use, energy, under one standard. Uh, and the next generation bit really means that we're focusing on making it modular. 
Um, so we have, in effect, uh, taken the standard apart and put it back together again in a more usable, practical order. So, for example, we know there's core elements to the gold standard. We know there's always going to be safeguards and stakeholder requirements uh, consistent across all projects. Uh, and then we know that you know, methodologies differ, differ by project type. So what we've tried to do is rather than having a, you know, if you consider our AR standard, for example, what we've tried to do is rather than having a forestry uh, carbon, carbon credit standard all rolled into one, now you have a core standard that talks to the key principles of gold standard. And then you have those methodologies and products in a much more flexible approach. Now that that allows us to that allows our users to be much more flexible in the use of the standard, but it also allows us to work with other standards and modules and recognise them much more easily within the framework of GS for GG. And that's really what we're getting at with next generation. Um, so, uh, what, in terms of our strategy, uh, we really um, very much uh, want to reassure everybody that uh, carbon credits is is a massive part of our future. You know, I've mentioned already corporate reporting, fund reporting, landscape reporting, all of those interest areas will be explored and, and be accessible to you guys as a community. Uh, but by no means should that be interpreted as us turning our backs on the carbon market. We very much see that the carbon market will have to adapt to the post-Paris environment, but we also see that it's, uh, it's beginning to pick up again and there's a lot of interest in that. Um, and once those solutions are in place, um, you know, we can move forward with confidence. Um, we really want to, again, I think it's kind of exciting for us, you know, a bit like the early days of the carbon market, gold standard feels well placed, I think, to help guide and shape that direction and to, and to show what can be achieved if you really apply best practice. Um, so it's very much back to our roots in that sense. Um, we also want to, um, uh, like I say, really explore the, the risks around the Paris Agreement. So do watch out uh, around COP time for our consultations on additionality and the double counting risk of uh, the NDCs uh, coming forward. So we'll be exploring what it means to have a project that's captured in the conditional, unconditional and outside NDCs, for example, and what that means for for double counting, additionality, baseline, etc. Um, anybody with a special interest in that, please do come forward. We'd be interested in hearing views um, in more detail. Um, and really, um, I think probably the revolutionary part of Gold Standard for the Global Goals, if you consider the modular approach to be evolutionary, is that we consider sustainable development uh, impacts on a much more broader basis. So we have a very similar set of rules to how you would have quant oh, sorry, demonstrated MDG contributions, but we also now you'll have seen our A dailies methodology, our black carbon methodology, our water methodologies. Uh, forthcoming will be a gender methodology. Uh, we're really going to be allowing uh, project users, project developers to quantify other SDG impacts and to use those either in a results based finance context or a um, uh, or a reporting context. Um, so there's some new um, new applications coming forward. Clearly, the environmental markets, the carbon markets uh, are our home. There are certainly other results-based finance for development markets around, uh, particularly when you look at development funds, impact investment funds, etc. Um, so thinking a little bit outside the box of what a project developer traditionally looks like and either allowing you know, the fund to use the standards to report or indeed working with funds to recognize gold standard for the global goals uh, so that project developers can access those funds more easily. Uh, corporate reporting is very exciting. We have a lot of interest in corporates using the standard um, to develop their own SDG programs and projects, uh, not so much for results-based finance, but in terms of corporate reporting. Uh, and some of you will have seen our sustainable urban development module. We're really looking to um, provide the tools and the certification approaches uh, to allow this, this approach to scale. Um, so yeah, indeed, uh, we are looking to um, uh, to continue with carbon credits, but also thinking of emissions reductions and sequestration beyond the traditional carbon markets as well, and working with our allies at Science Based Targets, RE100, CDP, etc., uh, to find ways to either recognise climate finance best practice, if you think of Science Based Targets, uh, recognise emissions reduction in Scope 3 reporting in things like CDP and GHG uh, protocol. Uh, and indeed, you know, things like insetting as well. Um, you know, the, the standard is well suited now to be able to adapt 
or be adaptable to new uh, to new markets like that. Uh, you may also have seen more recently that uh, we closed a consultation this week on uh, on gold standard labeling of uh, Rex. So starting with IREX, gold standard will provide labels on those products as well. So really moving uh, beyond uh, the carbon markets to to markets where our skill set will apply. And again, you know, there's, there's scope for the audit community to be involved in all of those initiatives. Um, I won't dwell on this. I think this is something you guys can read uh, in more detail on the various news updates on our website. But we are developing um, uh, some, 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 some thought leadership around best practice in climate reporting and very much backing the science-based targets approach for organizations to set reduction targets uh, to, to reduce at home, but then to have a strong mechanism to invest in climate security, be it mitigation or adaptation beyond their own uh, scope boundary. Um, and we're working closely with the likes of science-based targets, WWF and CDP, to have those approaches recognized, uh, which I think you know, we'll all understand um, will we'll provide a huge uh, new market opportunity with, with gold standard products. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's some new products to monetize. You know, I mentioned the, the renewable energy certificate labels. Uh, later in the year, uh, gender statements will come forward so that uh, projects that are going further in their gender um, uh, gender benefits, women's economic empowerment, for example, will be able to quantify that and receive statements for that. Uh, you will have seen RA Daily's methodology in health, and, and many of you will be familiar with our re previous water benefit certificates uh, standard, the water benefit standard that's incorporated into GS for GG as well. Um, I, again, I won't dwell on this. If you're interested in sustainable urban development, large-scale developments in cities, please do uh, reach out to us. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest from uh, municipal authorities, corporates that are involved in uh, things like municipal services, like waste management, for example, and indeed in uh, impact funds uh, where um, uh, MRV and, and uh, SDG impacts are at the heart of the fund. So sustainable urban development or cities has been around within gold standard for a little while now, but I think it's finally found its home in GS for GG um, and has generated a, a, you know, probably more even than we expected, more interest than um, than, than people perhaps have realized. So do take a look at that. You can see that within the standard. And if you're interested in cities, do reach out to us on that as well. Um, we have been um, also cognizant in amongst the excitement of all the new services and offerings of the standard, we've been cognizant that Gold Standard also has a duty to improve efficiency uh, in its processes and in its certification approach. Uh, and there's a number of features to that effect. I, I think the number one um, it's a hard sell, I guess, to external stakeholders, but that top one managing one standard is a massive step forward for us. It means what I can do as chief technical officer is innovate on uh, efficiency and have that applied to everybody rather than having to you know, innovate on efficiency and then figure out how to, how to apply it in forestry and in energy and in cities and in water. Um, so we can really apply the 80-20 rule now, I think, and bring forward some real gains that, uh, that you can all see. Uh, the other aspect of that, and I'll come back to this, is that um, uh, Gold Standard is a, an aspiring ICL Alliance member, which is, if you don't know, the, the kind of membership's body for standards. Um, and it's vital that we manage one standard rather than several um, so that we can apply the ICL codes just the once and really make the most of that efficiency. If you don't know ICL, I'm happy to, to share some views on that or take a look at their website. Um, that's um, that's the direction of travel for gold standard in the next couple of years. So um, it's worth being aware of where that's um, that's coming from. Uh, there are some streamlined features in the certification process. We've uh, changed our review process, our peer review process to uh, a base default assumption that we will have one round of review or one reviewer will review each project as it comes forward rather than two reviewers uh, and reserve the two review model for um, the more risky projects. So first of their kind or very large projects, for example, will have two reviewers. Uh, that allows us to be more consistent. It allows us to be more efficient internally with our resource. It allows us to allocate more quickly as we're relying on a roster of experts uh, rather than the availability of internal staff. So lots of gains there. And then within GS for GG certification cycle, we've been able to reduce uh, the design certification uh, review, which was formerly registration review from six weeks to four weeks. Um, so there's a few areas where we've been able to, um, to, to chip away at the efficiency. I'm very, very hopeful that uh, in the coming years, we'll, we'll be improving that further with, um, with, with you know, further you know, procedural gains, but also uh, IT uh, solutions. You'll see shortly, actually, that we'll be launching our Cookstove IQ um, uh, web platform, which will allow Cookstove users to input their methodological inputs into an online form uh, rather than 
to, to show their calculations in Excel or a PDD, uh, which, which, will, which I think will make everybody's lives more consistent and easy. Um, I'm very excited to draw attention to the UNFCCC collaboration. I don't want to dwell on it too long now as it's not the focus here, but um, just a huge step forward for gold standard in terms of the reputation uh, and brand uh, recognition that that brings uh, and also the access to the UNFCCC um, uh, network, uh, the kind of clout that they bring in terms of authority on certain topics. Uh, and we'll be working with the, um, the secretariat there to develop new tools, methodologies and approaches in the coming years. Again, if people are interested in that or sit across UNFCCC panels, uh, be interested to hear from you on what we could be doing under that, that initiative. Um, I won't dwell on this either, but Gold Standard IQ is really about uh, new IT that will come forward shortly. The first uh, example of that is the new microsite for the standard, which will hopefully be much more intuitive to follow than, than perhaps you've seen in our previous versions. Uh, and likewise, um, you know, new individual activity type uh, tools like the Cookstove IQ coming forward in the next month. Uh, you know, do explore that when it comes out. Right, so we get to the crux of it. What's new in the standard? Uh, as I say, the standard is now modular. Uh, there are four key modules that you'd be interested in as, a, as an auditor. Uh, they are the two on the left, which are principles and requirements and activity requirements. Uh, they're mandatory for all projects. And actually, for the first time, if you apply those two, you can stop there and just certify as a gold standard project. There's no longer an assumption that you will follow a methodology and issue carbon credits, for example. Uh, so that's quite a major innovation for us and, and one that there's, there's, there's more interest than perhaps we expected in um, you know, for things like just you know, M&E of NGO work, for example, uh, being able to just use the standard for that purpose. Uh, the principles and requirements really reflect all of the key aspects of gold standard historically, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The activity requirements are really things like deviations, der derogations, or specific rules for specific activity types. So for those of you that have audited uh, large hydro projects in the past, you'll recall that we have some quite specific rules for large hydro. Uh, they live in the activity requirements because they're obviously applicable to just one activity type. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, all of our carbon credit methodologies are ported across, uh, along with our health methodology, water methodologies, uh, and soon gender. Um, there's no changes to those methodologies, so um, uh, there's no particular need to be, uh, from your side, to be analysing those methodologies to see if they're the same as the previous versions. They're just ported across. Um, so the real main focus for you guys, I think, is on the principles and requirements side. Uh, and then there's product requirements. So the, yeah, the rules that concern issuance of carbon credits, double counting, that kind of thing are embedded in there. Uh, and really by breaking it up in this sense, we get, um, we get to that greater degree of flexibility for the, the project developer. Um, so just in terms of what's in each section, so in that, uh, in those mandatory requirements, principle one concerns climate security and the SDGs, uh, in that um, uh, kind of replaces the previous requirement in version 2.2 to issue carbon credits and demonstrate two MDG contributions. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, principle two really replaces the previous do no harm assessment with uh, what looks like quite a long list of safeguards, but I'll explain in a little bit uh, why that's not such as onerous as it might seem at first glance. Uh, principle three is around stakeholder inclusivity and is very, very similar to our previous approaches. Uh, principle four is really about demonstrating impacts are real. So although you can just certify as a project, we still expect you to follow robust MRV. So you might not be following a methodology, but we do expect you to continue to verify. Um, and so that principle four really speaks to the, the certification process. Uh, and then principle five talks about financial additionality and ongoing financial need. Um, uh, we recognize that not all projects will need to demonstrate additionality if they're not seeking carbon credits, for example. Uh, so that kind of principle five is a, is a context specific principle. We also introduced the concept of ongoing financial need, and I'll come back to that in a moment to explain. Uh, and then on the flexible elements side, really, uh, as I say, the, the methodologies being ported across will contain what you've seen before, um, but it allows uh, projects to more flexibly select which methodologies and which products they're going to follow. Um, you know, a, yeah, probably an early example of what that's allowed us to do is to label uh, renewable energy certificates for the first time, which was very difficult to do under version 2.2, uh, which was entirely focused on carbon credits. Um, so a slightly busy slide, but this kind of explains some of the some example pathways. So working from left to right there, the two green uh, columns are the mandatory requirements and the blue, the optional requirements. 
Uh, if you imagine a cookstove project, uh, as with all projects, it would apply the principles and requirements and it would apply the community service activity requirements. Uh, you know, a cookstove project could certify just by following those two uh, modules. Uh, but then typically of cookstove projects, uh, you could follow the emissions reduction methodology and the carbon credit products requirements and go on and issue carbon credits. Or you could issue a dailies by following the a dailies methodology and a dailies claims guidelines. And for the first time, we'll allow you to stack those. There's some, some rules around that, but projects can issue both carbon credits and a dailies uh, from the same project. Uh, renewable energy, similarly, uh, if you follow the renewable energy emissions reductions methodologies under CDM, you can issue carbon credits. Uh, but now for the first time, you can also follow our renewable energy label uh, product requirements and issue labeled IREX or IREC labels anyway, um, which is quite an exciting development. There's no methodology associated with that because um, IREX is really a megawatt hour uh, provision. Uh, we won't allow you to stack um, carbon credits and IREX for the same megawatt hour. Uh, that's one thing to note, but you can issue both from the same project for the first time. Um, so really, I think this uh, kind of flow just shows the optionality that's available to projects right now. Um, and, you know, you can probably imagine the scope for that if there's more market marketable methodologies for different SDGs coming forward, uh, then this kind of decision tree can only, you know, can only really grow from here, I think. Um, so just uh, briefly on some of the key changes, principle one, which is around uh, sustainable development impacts. Previously, you had to demonstrate a positive contribution to two MDGs and neutral in another and all projects had to issue carbon credits. Now what we say is you have to contribute to SDG 13, uh, which is climate mitigation, and that could be you know, through carbon credits, uh, and to two additional uh, SDGs. Um, and so really that provision hasn't changed a great deal other than the... Um, uh, other than to say that the uh, the kind of scope is a little more open, I suppose. Uh, the safeguarding principles has been been overhauled from do no harm, and you'll find a lot more safeguards and a lot more detail, but that really reflects the bringing together of all of our standards under one header. So, for example, a lot of the land use standards are in there. Uh, the idea of that is that projects will demonstrate uh, when uh, a safeguard isn't applicable to them. So although it looks like a lot of safeguards, if you're a wind farm, for example, you won't have to do a lot of work to demonstrate that you're not involved in animal husbandry or genetically modified crops, for example. Um, so it looks like a lot, but actually when you strip out the ones that aren't relevant to specific project types, you'll very likely find no more than you had under version 2.2, for example. Um, so it, it takes a little bit of getting used to, um, and we've tried to provide more clarity in the requirements. So it's a lengthy document compared to do no harm, but I think when people get used to it, uh, they'll see that um, it's it's clearer and um, uh, you know there's, there's not actually more questions to answer than previous. Uh, the stakeholder consultation uh, process is, is almost identical to previous. The only real difference is we expect projects to consider whether there are affected stakeholders as well as local stakeholders. So is there anybody outside the boundary, for example, that could be affected by a project um, is an important question to answer, particularly, for example, if a project is like, a, let's say, afforestation, um, and might have an impact on the watershed. Um, so it's that really that provision. Uh, again, many projects won't really have much to answer in that sense. So a cookstove project, for example, you can. Um, it's hard to imagine that there's, there's going to be a huge amount of affected stakeholders outside the project boundary. Um, so um, that's really a new rule, um, you know, but, but likely to be applied in specific contexts. Uh, I'll come on to the demonstration of real outcomes, which is the new certification cycle in just a second. Uh, and then financial additionality, we'll be making use of the CDM tools as we've always done. There are some slight tweaks to certain activity types for what is deemed additional, but mostly that will be familiar to you. Probably the biggest single change in this section is that on certification renewal, we are going to be expecting a demonstration that gold standard um, financial support is still required um, so that a project still needs carbon credits. That, that doesn't mean it's not additional. It just means that when a market changes and a project type can support itself properly, uh, that we have an instrument that allows us to not continue to divert climate finance or carbon finance to that project, um, you know, if it can survive on its own two feet. So I'll just quickly go through the um, the new certification cycle. As I say, I will post this uh, to the website so you can read it in more detail and ask questions later. Um, it's very much still ex post, ex ante approach. Uh, the ex ante approach will be very familiar. You go through a round of preliminary review. Uh, that really replaces PFA uh, in the previous versions. Um, and there's a pathway there for a, a desk-based quick check or a more detailed check, depending on the project that's being brought forward. So forestry, for example, will still require a more detailed preliminary review, but more common energy projects are still likely to go through that pretty quickly. 
uh, and that results in uh, the project being listed. Uh, projects will still appoint uh, a validation verification body to conduct a validation. Um, so obviously good news for you guys. Um, and uh, you guys will provide the report as normal upon which Gold Standard will review and decide whether to, um, to certify the project design. That's a slight change in terminology actually to get used to. Uh, we no longer refer to registration, but to project design certification. Uh, the reason for that shift is to try to make it more intuitive to new users um, and uh, to reflect the fact that that step is in fact a certification decision. Uh, registration doesn't really convey that very well. Um, and then ex post, again, very similar uh, projects will appoint a VVB to conduct a verification. Uh, Gold Standard will conduct a performance review and issuance as they have done previously, as we have done previously. Uh, the only difference is the two critical differences ex post are that on years when there's no verification, uh, we expect projects to publish an annual report of their activity. Uh, that's very simple. It's not certified or, or reviewed in detail by gold standard. It's not expected to be very long. It's really an opportunity for us to check that the project is still continuing, that it still exists, and that it's still managing its processes. Uh, so really, we're expecting a short narrative update uh, and any key changes or updates to be, um, to be published in those annual reports. Uh, and if you verify, then the year you verify, you don't need to do that as a, as a project developer. Uh, but then the critical change is that the, uh, the certification renewal period, instead of a fixed 10-year or 7-year renewal, or in land use, uh, kind of fixed 30 to 50 years, uh, we require a 5-year renewal cycle, which kind of falls in line with the Paris timescales. Um, and we have changed some of the maximum crediting periods per activity type, and you can find those within the standard. So five years um, is, uh, like I say, in line with the Paris Agreement. It allows us to be more realistic on investment decisions, and we fully expect other standards to follow suit in due course on that. Uh, what we're finding with some of the longer crediting cycles is that uh, you might have certain markets or certain sectors that uh, become you know, transformative in that time period, uh, but could still be issuing um, carbon credits after 20 years, despite being completely commercially viable. And so, so that's a, a tightening of rules to make sure um, finance is by being directed where it's most needed. Um, so really, as I say, the key changes for the certification cycle is that it's now based on five years uh, with a limit of one renewal. So maximum 10 years for most projects. Uh, but certain projects are longer than that. So, for example, land use, cook stoves, renewable energy, uh, there's a slightly longer maximum cycle for that, uh, subject to the, the proving of ongoing financial need. Uh, all projects have to publish an annual report. There's no extra work in that for VVBs. We're not expecting a VVB review of that. Uh, Gold Standard won't review it either. It's really just to make sure that the project is still continuing, as I said. Um, so just a few exceptions, uh, although we allow stacking, generally renewable energy projects can stack carbon credits with uh, labelled IREX, uh, but not for the same megawatt hours. Uh, we're going to um, allow a maximum 15 years for renewable energy and community service projects. Uh, so instead of the 10 year, it's 15 years. And for community projects like cook stoves, uh, we're not expecting baseline to be checked after five years. Uh, there's some new definitions around scale in renewable energy and CFA that are worth checking out. Um, they're fairly simple and intuitive to follow, so no major uh, challenges there for new projects, but it's worth being aware of those. And there's some new additionality criteria, deemed additionality criteria for uh, things like cook stoves or wash projects at the micro scale uh, to check out. Uh, and really, so uh, as, as I come towards the end, um, this is a, a brief overview of what it means for VVBs. Uh, so with GS for GG, we've taken the opportunity really to to our to, to take a look at the certification process and how we recognise uh, valid validation and verification bodies as being eligible to audit gold standard projects. And the objectives really are to clarify how certification decisions are made. So if you look at our previous versions, it's actually not that easy to see how a certification decision is made. It's not particularly transparent. Uh, and so we really wanted to clarify the role of third party audit versus the role of peer review of gold standard. Um, and so you can find that in the VVB requirements. Uh, we're, we want to come in line with the ICL code principles. So that requires us to uh, demonstrate the role of third party auditors um, and impartiality and rigor and consistency. So within the VVB requirements, you'll see some of that um, overlay uh, dealt with. Uh, you can see how the ICL uh, requirements are compared to the gold standard requirements. Um, we wanted to formalize the VVB approval process and make that a, a kind of positive choice, really, that uh, VVBs are opting into the gold standard system rather than 
simply being able to access it just because you they, you know because an auditor has say DOE accreditation. Um, so we really want a positive choice that people have chosen to join the the scheme, uh, and to formalise that recognition as well to make sure that um, that we've taken the time to review. Uh, the uh, application of uh, auditors and that we take the time to share performance feedback with you all um, and, and to improve the quality of our training uh, over the coming period as well. So really, I think, um, you know, there's not so many major changes in terms of what that actually means, um, but it really is a kind of making a, an overhaul to the system to make it more robust and transparent. That's really the key aim here, I think. So the key change for you guys is really that uh, going forward, we'll expect an application from auditors seeking to be eligible under the gold standard. Um, so um, that, that's a kind of two part system. Uh, the first part being that we will recognize accreditations. Uh, so, for example, right now we recognize DOE accreditation. We recognize ANSI VVB 14,065 accreditation. And for forestry, we recognize ASI FSC certificate accreditation. So we'll continue to recognize accreditations and we may expand that list for you know, new certification pathways like cities or in uh, specific geographical contexts like Australia, where there's very few auditors. Um, we might uh, look at recognizing more um, uh, third party accreditations. For example, we might uh, recognize uh, the broader system of ISO 14065. Uh, that should give you all uh, more choice on your, your route to entry to gold standard. Uh, and with that, then, uh, assuming you've got one of those accreditations, you would make an application to Gold Standard, which is a fairly simple process that includes uh, a demonstration of your your kind of um, team structure and the competence you have within that team, uh, which I know for many of you will be no problem at all. Uh, and Gold Standard will, will review that. Uh, it'll be peer reviewed by our technical advisory committee. And that's really an ICL matter to make sure that uh, there's some impartiality in how um, VVBs are approved. And with that, um, assuming that it's approved, then uh, you become a GS VVB, which means you can audit the projects that you're competent to, to, to take part in. Um, that would be a 36-month approval uh, system. So you would you'd gain approval for 36 months uh, and then would uh, reapply, uh, although we would expect the reapplication process to be simpler than the initial application process, given that we would um, obviously have a close relationship during that period. Um, there would also be an annual um, sort of check-in, so 12-month performance feedback exchange. And you know, as time progresses, we'd like that to be a two-way street. So we'll, we'll very much share feedback that we've had on auditor performance, which I know many of you have asked us to do in a more kind of systematic way historically. Uh, but we'd also like feedback from you guys and how we can make the system simpler. So exciting to see how that, um, how that feedback loop develops over time. Um, the, the new eligibility process, so as I say, you'll be eligible to apply to gold standard and to be approved to gold standard uh, with a recognized accreditation. Um, so you know, there's no danger to any of the accreditations you already hold. So the ones we recognize right now will continue to be eligible. Uh, a high level assessment of the competency of your team for the different pathways you've applied for. So really, that's just a sense check to make sure you have the, the team that has experience in the types of projects that you're looking to audit. Um, uh, we want to uh, to name individuals. We want to understand who your team leaders are and your uh, GSVVB uh, sort of validation, sorry, GS validator verifier, so individual auditors, um, so that we can we can track that and and you know provide more targeted training and performance as needed. Um, and then there's some application fees associated with that, and you can see the fees uh, on the Gold Standard website where I directed you um, earlier on. Um, so in terms of timescales, uh, we recognize that um, we can't go from zero to uh, asking you to uh, apply for eligibility uh, within uh, within a short space of time. So we've tried to provide a bit of a grace period here to to give uh, you, you know, the guy, you, know, you guys that are already in our system a little time to adjust. So just laying out here that the new standard published on the 10th of July, um, so you probably saw that last week. Uh, it comes into effect for new projects on the 14th of August, although existing projects and projects that are going through validation right now, for example, uh, have some grace periods and some transition timelines that you can go and read on the website as well. Um, and then from the 1st of November, um, uh, you know, all new projects will use gold standard for the global goals. So any commission for a new project that you pick up post the 1st of November will be a GS for GG um, effective standard. Now, for the VVB applications, for you guys, what that really means is that if you have any existing engagements right now, so anything you've signed up to provide a validation or verification on right now, and up to the 1st of November, 
there's no additional requirements for that. You should um, continue to do that unaffected. So we're not expecting you to make an application or anything like that to finish existing signed commissions. So any agreement you've entered into before the 1st of November should proceed as it has done and was intended to do. Uh, and there's no interference there from our side. Um, to take on new commissions after the 1st November, uh, we will require you to make your application to us. Uh, we'd encourage you to do that as soon as possible um, so that we can um, we can really get ahead of the curve and make those approvals as quickly as possible. But the 1st of November is really the cutoff uh, for, um, uh, for existing VVBs to make their application. And if you make your application before the 1st of November, you can continue to take commissions after the 1st of November right up to the point that you're approved. So that really allows you that co continuity of service to your clients. Um, if you don't apply by the 1st of November, effectively, it's a new application. Uh, you know, when you do come back, if you decide to come back after the 1st of November, it will be a new application and you wouldn't be able to be eligible to audit gold standard projects until that application is approved. So really, this uh, kind of system of, of grace and transition allows you to, to continually provide that service by applying by the 1st of November. Um, and so just to, uh, briefly to wrap up this presentation and what's next, um, so just some upcoming milestones. Um, there's some milestones here for the standard, but before I go into those, just to let you know, um, beginning of August, there'll be a more detailed training session on GS for GG. So just to remind as we approach the Q&A period here that um, technical questions about the standard, you know, hold them for that, um, that presentation or drop them to help at goldstandard.org. Uh, we're running this webinar again this evening, GMT, um, and you can join again if you think of another question or do come back to us if you don't. Uh, really, the key milestone for you guys, I think, to keep in mind is that 1st of November application date. Um, so if you, uh, if you don't apply you know, on or before the 1st of November, um, then, then it would be a fresh application. Um, and obviously, you wouldn't be eligible to take on projects after the 1st until that was approved. Um, but in terms of other standards milestones, uh, our gender responsive framework will release in October, and that allows uh, projects to certify SDG5 impact statements. Um, that's quite an exciting one. So anybody who has clients interested in uh, gender outcomes, then that, that's a, a point to note for you guys. Uh, consultation on additionality, ongoing financial need, and some of the changes that as we approach the post-2020 voluntary carbon markets. Uh, we'll likely release that around September, um, and it will continue through COP in Bonn in November. Um, and we'd really love to hear from auditors or anybody working on those topics. So please do um, submit your thoughts or come forward and let us know if you're interested in participating in that. Um, we will be seeking full ICL membership. Um, as I say, if you don't know ICL, it's worth uh, taking a quick look at their overarching principles. There's some really good uh, videos and documentation there that you can familiarize yourself with. Um, as I say, really, that's... Uh, a kind of system of governance best practice for standards. It's very much a system that speaks to the quality of governance, not to the quality of the content of the standard. So really it's for matters like certification processes, uh, oversight and uh, performance monitoring, how standards are set, how grievances are dealt with, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of our systems are already in line with ICL, but there's some work to do in various topics. So if you are interested in, in ICL, then do take a look at that. Um, I think you'll find it very interesting as auditors. Uh, and then really, uh, the last one there, uh, there's a number of new SDG tools and methodologies planned over the coming months and years, as well as new uses of the standard in things like fund reporting, corporate reporting, cities-based reporting, um, et cetera, et cetera. Very exciting to, to see, for example, uh, scope three reporting and insetting coming forward in the coming months and years as well. Um, so really lots of, of innovation to follow. Um, both in new tools, but also uh, in um, markets that speak uh, to the carbon markets, but also uh, kind of outside that world as well, and to expand the range and use of gold standard uh, as it, uh, and its client base. Um, so uh, just, uh, just to sign off for what it means for projects, so the dates are similar as they were for you guys in VVB application. Um, up until the 1st of November, all um, projects that are you know, have submitted to gold standard already can continue to register under version 2.2 or 0.9 in land use. So if you're working on a project right now um, and it's been submitted to gold standard, then uh, it can continue to be finished under the previous version of the standard. Uh, so there's no need for you to do anything for projects that you're already working on that have been submitted to gold standard. Um, you can transition earlier if your client chooses to transition earlier. That's totally fine as well. And we can discuss how to do that. But there's no obligation to. Um, so really nothing for you guys to think about for the new standard until uh, the 1st of November. 
Um, and then after that, uh, we are looking for all existing projects to transition to gold standard for the global goals. Um, that will happen at the first available verification that takes place on or after the 1st of March 2018. So there's just over six months um, uh, transition uh, grace period for existing projects that are in a crediting cycle right now. Uh, the reason we want to do that, as I said earlier, if we bring all projects across to the new standard, that allows us to be more consistent and efficient with our changes and updates, uh, but also because um, it's a kind of necessity, really. Uh, we can't have a project that registers now on a fixed 10-year term still reporting MDGs and against the Kyoto Protocol in 2027 when the, the SDGs are almost finished. That doesn't really make sense, as you can imagine. Um, so there's a there's a very solid reason to transition, I think, um, uh, for everybody. Uh, and I must say, we've had some really positive responses. I haven't had a project developer say they don't want to transition or that they don't see why they should have to. So um, that was a you know a understandable concern um, that people had, but we've really not heard that feedback. Uh, the transition process post first March 2018, we're going to keep that as simple as possible. Um, it will be largely in house by gold standards. So if you're commissioned to conduct a verification. Uh, post 1st March 2018, uh, there's going to be very little difference for you guys. Uh, the project developer will submit evidence to gold standard uh, based on some checklists that we'll provide them. And we'll analyze that internally and decide if they can um, uh, you know, approve uh, them to transition to GS for GG. And then really the GS for GG requirements kick in more, more fully at the following verification. So really at the next verification post 1st March 2018, uh, there should be little disruption to the service you guys are providing to project developers. It's the one after that, really, where those new requirements will kick in in more detail for, for VVBs. Um, so it's a pretty, um, a pretty straightforward timeline. Um, I appreciate there's a lot to take in in a webinar. Uh, this, these slides will be presented. You can find these details in the transition requirements uh, of the standard, which you can find on the microsite. And I'll make sure that the, the links to all of those documents are circulated after this call. Um, so... Uh, no need to try and sort of scramble some notes together right now. I appreciate there's a lot of dates and information to take in. Uh, and that's really it from my side. That was a pretty long presentation. Uh, I kept, uh, didn't keep to my promise of 20 to 30 minutes, unfortunately, but um, there was a lot to convey, uh, as you can expect. Um, but now I'm, I'm sort of you know, happy, happy to take um, uh, any questions you guys might have. Uh, we've, uh, we've got 45 minutes allocated, but we can run over uh, if we don't. Um, you can do this in, in three ways. If you prefer to be more anonymous or you think of something later, uh, submit your uh, question to help at goldstandard.org. Um, that's the best place to do it. And then we'll uh, log that and come back to you in a more um, uh, considered fashion. Uh, and then in terms of this webinar, you can either put your hand up using the hand up icon and I'll unmute you to ask your question. Uh, or you can um, drop a question into the questions box. Um, and I see a few of you have already done that. So I'll, I'll start there shortly. Um, so I'll just take a moment to take a breather and drink a, a little bit of water, and then I'll, um, I'll I'll respond to some of those questions in the um, uh, in the box there. Okay, so I'm just going to work through the questions people have submitted to the Q and A box, and I see a couple of hands up too. So I'll respond to the written questions first, uh, and then I'll, I'll hopefully clear those, uh, and then we can do the the kind of hands up Q and A ones as well. Um, so the first is from Javier. Thanks, Javier. NDCs and ITMOs on the UNFCCC level, how will they affect gold standard carbon credits from 2020 on? I mean, it's the, the question on everybody's lips, frankly, what, what happens to the carbon markets post-2020? So with GS for GG as a base standard, we've not tried to address that because that's a, a kind of topic for a very specific um, uh, product, carbon credits. Um, but to rest assured, we are about to move into a very... Um, thorough phase of, of evaluation and what happens to voluntary carbon markets post 2020. Uh, and there'll be some studies that we're uh, working on in the next three months and presenting some feedback at COP. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to consult on that. Um, in terms of our views right now, on how it affects um, uh, carbon credits post 2020, um, I would say uh, there's, there will be a carbon market post 2020 uh, in both compliance and voluntary. The NDCs definitely complicate that. The fact that everybody has an, a national account uh, we'll make double counting a tricky topic, uh, but we, we fully expect um, you know clubs of countries to come together, bilateral agreements, etc., um, and certain types of project or NDC to have um, the ability to issue carbon credits still uh, post environment, uh, post 2020 environment. So we definitely see the carbon credit market continuing, uh, but we also see a market for uh, related products that will come forward as well. And I, I'd sort of draw attention to two really. 
there's one that relates to emissions reduction statements. So we know there are a lot of uh, corporates, for example, interested in supporting their domestic NDC um, and are happy for that not to be a carbon credit matter and would issue themselves with a, a kind of emissions reduction statement that's not for trade and not for not for uh, carbon offsetting, but to show that they supported a certain type of project, uh, which kind of is, is a subtly different claim, but gets around some of the double counting challenges. Um, and so we expect Gold Standard to be able to provide that uh, that service. Uh, we also expect uh, insetting and uh, kind of scope three reporting to be a big deal uh, coming forward for corporates as well, particularly if we can work with colleagues at CDP to recognize that. So uh, I, I think in summary, I would say that the carbon markets will exist uh, they'll become more uh, kind of fragmented and there'll be specific uses of carbon credits. Uh, but I think there's also real opportunities in new related products like statements and insetting that will come forward. Um, we also have new products coming forward like Label Direct, for example, for energy projects. So uh, we're also going to diversify a little bit to allow people a little bit more breathing room as the markets change. Um, there will be, as I say, um, a lot more thought leadership from Gold Standard coming out over the next six months and real opportunities for people to consult upon that. Um, so, so I would say watch this space as well. I, hopefully um, that answers your question, uh, Javier. Uh, a question from uh, Robert. Ha are these goals adopted from the Millennium Development Goals? Um, so the SDGs, if you don't know, replace the MDGs. Uh, the SDGs run through to 2030, uh, and they're really a world apart from the MDGs. The MDGs were 11 fairly straightforward sounding goals, but without a lot of robustness to them. Uh, the SDGs is 17 goals and 180 targets, um, a, a lot more detail uh, and a, a lot more usability. Now, the SDGs, like the MDGs, are focused at national level. So we are going to be coming up with systems of how to how to deal with that at project level. There's a very basic system to do that already within gs for gg uh, but we'll be providing the tools to do that as well as, as time progresses. So SDG reporting tools for specific project types, for example, will come forward as well. Um, so they are uh, they are familiar. They'll be familiar to MDG users, but they're certainly not the same. Um, for transition projects, we would expect uh, the to be able to convert people's MDGs into SDG contributions fairly straightforwardly. Um, so you would recognise MDGs and the SDGs, but there'll be a system that will will help transition projects to kind of re-communicate, if you like, in the SDG language. Uh, another question from Robert, how, how about the current projects issuance still continue, has to adopt the updated SDG? So as I say, current projects issuance is unaffected. All projects will transition to gold standard for the global goals after the timescales I laid out. And part of that transition will, will involve adopting the language they've used for MDGs uh, to the SDGs. Uh, I, I hopefully got across the point that you won't have to make more contributions than you did before as a project. So it was two MDGs plus carbon credits before. Now it's two SDGs plus a contribution to SDG 13, uh, which can be carbon credits. So there's no more of a requirement than there was previously. Um, but clearly some of the, the, pro the process to demonstrate that changes somewhat uh, in, in line with the SDGs. Uh, but yeah, we don't expect um, project issuance uh, to, be, uh, to be affected in that sense. Uh, a question from Chang. Uh, apologies, Chang. It sounds like I've spoken a little quickly in a few, uh, a few places there. I'll, uh, I'll slow down um, uh, for, for the Q&A. Thanks, thanks, Chang, for pointing that out. Um, uh, I think Robert's questions repeat. Uh, how does the REC work? Um, it's a question around our labeling of renewable energy certificates. Um, you can see on our website that we recorded the webinar that I presented on Monday, actually, if you want to find out more about renewable energy certificate labeling. Uh, you'll see it on the website as well in the consultations page, uh, which is now closed, but you can see the documentation that explains how renewable energy certificate labeling will work. Um, but you'll find it very similar to something like CER labeling uh, without the methodological requirements. So really, it's about apply applying gold standards to the issuance of IREX initially. Um, so it should be a, a system that's familiar with some, some nuance, I guess, uh, but you can see those on the website. Uh, when will the crediting period of five years be effective? Uh, that will come into effect for new projects that register under GS for GG from the 1st of November. So uh, all new projects will apply to that. And then transition projects, when they transition, they will keep the balance of their existing crediting period. Uh, so for example, if you're a seven-year crediting period and two years in, when you transition, you'll keep the balance of that five years. And when you transition, oh, sorry, when you come to renewal, then you'll switch to the five-year cycle at that point. 
Um, so uh, existing crediting period that people are in the middle of won't be affected. Uh, what about the current projects going for RCP? I'm sorry, I'm not sure quite what, I, what RCP is standing for, Robert. Perhaps if you could just drop that into another question, I can come back to that one or, or, or email me directly. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're... Uh, sorry, it means renewal of, renewal of crediting period. I, I understand, apologies. Uh, yeah, so uh, I said that um, uh, projects will transition uh, at the first available verification uh, from the 1st of March, but I should have clarified uh, that also goes for certification renewals as well. So any certification renewal that takes place after the 1st of March 2018 uh, will also transition to GS for GG at the same time. Uh, if you're going through a renewal of crediting period now, uh, between now and the 1st of March, then you can continue to do that uh, under the previous version and you would transition at the next verification after the 1st of March. Um, you can find all those requirements in the transition document that's, uh, that's on the website. Uh, when will the approval process start? So I, I assume that means for uh, the validation and verification bodies. Uh, that really starts um, uh, so by application uh, deadline of 1st of November 2017. So uh, if you wish to continue to take on GS projects after the 1st of November, uh, then we need your application by that date. Uh, I would say the earlier the better so that we can turn those around uh, quickly for you guys. Uh, but yeah, the deadline is the 1st of November 2017 for that. Uh, is an accreditation obligatory requirement for applying as a VVB? Uh, in the initial requirements, yes. Um, so having either DOE status, ANSI ISO 14065 status, or ASI FSC status is required. Uh, but we are exploring how to extend that list to other accreditations. Um, to fill you in on the why there, uh, ICL requires us to have a system of third party uh, assessment and approval of auditors. Um, and the third party bit's important for, uh, for uh, impartiality. So it's really important that we don't do that ourselves at gold standard. We can add to that, but we can't do it all ourselves. Uh, otherwise, we're in breach of kind of best practice, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the, the currently recognized accreditations will continue. If you're interested in having another accreditation recognized by gold standard, so for example, if you are, say, uh, DAX 14,065 accredited in Germany, uh, we would we would be happy to explore that and extend that list of recognized accreditations into the future. Uh, what about ISO 17,065 for RECs? Uh, kind of related to my last question at the moment, uh, it's not um, eligible, uh, but we are happy to explore whether there are other accreditations that could be brought forward and recognized. Uh, we're going to be coming up with a system for the recognition of, uh, of further accreditations uh, so that we can broaden the range. I think, Javier, you raise a good point there that that as gold standard broadens out, uh, we'll, we'll need sort of a broader broader uh, recognition of accreditations to kind of cope with those areas beyond carbon, for example. It's a, it's a, it's a valid point. Uh, can we con conduct an assignment on GS version three before the 1st of November, uh, 2017? So um, basically the system is that if you take on a commission uh, before 1st of November, 2017, uh, that means that you sign a legal agreement for a validation, um, then you can continue to do that uh, without GS uh, VVB approval. It, what happens post 1st of November is that you can't take on um, new commissions after that date if you haven't made your application. So in short, yes, if you take on an assignment before the 1st of November, then you can continue to do that under the current system. Uh, will GS develop VVB reporting templates? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, there's a few things going on here. So we'll provide an application template. Uh, I think you, you've got that in the website already. So the application that you need to make for approval, uh, there's a form for that. Um, but we're also going to be coming up with um, conformity checklists so that you guys can have a uh, kind of more templated approach to submitting evidence for your um, your validation verification reports. Uh, we'd also be interested in, in um, exemplars if people have uh, systems that you're happy to share with others, then then you know you think would 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 benefit the GS community. Then then we'd be happy to receive those. Um, but yes, we'll be bringing forward templates fairly shortly. Uh, what is the five year cycle, and what's the maximum crediting period for a project activity? So I, I went over this. Um, uh, apologies if I went a little quickly. Um, the five year cycle just means that all projects now are based on a five year renewal cycle instead of the seven year or ten year fixed. Um, it means that at the year five uh, renewal, uh, the baseline should be updated and projects, if they're seeking carbon credits, for example, have to prove that they still need gold standard finance. Uh, there are some exemptions to that for specific project types. 
Uh, as a default, uh, there's one renewal available for projects, so a maximum of 10 years. Uh, but for renewable energy and community projects, it's 15. And for land use, it's as per the existing standards, so 30 or 50 years, depending on your, your pathway. Um, so the maximum crediting period is very much changing in line with the post-Paris environment, uh, and it's worth certainly reading up on that in the standard. Uh, projects in uh, renewal right now, what version is to be used? So if you're renewing right now, uh, then you should use the, uh, the existing version, the version that it's currently registered under. Um, that would only change from the 1st of March 2018. So if there's a crediting renewal any day after the 1st of March 2018, then a transition process would take place uh, to GS for GG. Um, so right now, if you're, uh, if you're doing a certification renewal, then you should continue under the version that it's registered under. Uh, what's the timeline for the project developer to, tra to transition? So again, uh, the timeline there is the 1st of March 2018 is the key date. Um, that's the date after which at the next available verification or renewal transition will take place. Uh, regarding the new, ten the new PDD templates, are there some information uh, which is required to be provided earlier? Uh, but not required anymore, um, for example, in the case of cookstove POA DDs. Um, so the new templates are on the new standard website. You can download them from the standards documents and take a look there. Uh, we've tried to refine them and, and make them as consistent as possible. So we had pretty different templates for different project types. Um, so we have tried to unify that somewhat. Um, there are some specific um, uh, DD templates like the microscale DD and the, and the POA DDs. Um, so do take a look at the website um, and then we'll be some specific uh, guidance for, for different project types developed, but at the moment it's the, the template PDDs can be found in the website, in the microsite. Um, is it possible to only have one performance check verification during the five-year period? If so, will this decrease the number of DOE services and income? Um, so that's kind of possible right now, I suppose. The, the cycle dictates that um, we, you, can, you have to verify within the first two years uh, post-certification or implementation, um, that's the minimum. Um, and we don't require you to do more than that within five years. Uh, but in the existing version, that's the same, really. We require you to do it within a certain date, uh, but we don't, we don't insist on, on annual verification, even in version 2.2. Uh, but obviously projects tend to do that because that's the way um, uh, the carbon markets work. So we, we're not insisting on that. We don't necessarily envisage uh, project developer behavior changing because of that, um, because that's really something they can access already. Um, so we, we don't require people to do it more than once, uh, but we don't actually require them to do that, um, that, that under the existing versions either. So we're not expecting a great change there. Uh, will standard documents also be available as PDF file or offline? Uh, yes, is the brief answer. Maybe I can just quickly show you how to find that. Um, if you go to a standard document on the website, I'll just try and quickly open up the, the core standard here. So hopefully you can see this. If you go to the little print icon up here in the right-hand side of the website, you can download as a PDF using that. Um, so you can very much download them all offline um, as you need. Yeah. Uh, so another question, is it correct that in, in future each auditor assessing under a VVB will have to be recognized uh, by GS along with a fee? So yes, that's the, the principle is that we will um, recognize uh, validation verification bodies uh, under an application process, and there is a fee attached to that. Um, I know that's not a hugely popular decision. Obviously, nobody wants to, to be, uh, have, have more fees imposed. Uh, but what it'll allow us to do is create a much more robust uh, system uh, process on our side and to provide higher quality training to you guys um, uh, so that you can, you can sort of you know, improve your service as well. Um, then I have uh, lost a bit of sound, I think. Yeah, hopefully I'm back. Um, applying as DOE to UNFCCC, please confirm when I should apply for GS for GG. Um, so DOE accreditation will continue to be recognized and um, the application ideally should be made by the 1st of November uh, 2017 so that you can continue to take on gold standard projects after that date. Um, I think I lost my sound briefly there. Neha, can I just check that you can still hear me? Uh, yes, Owen, I can still hear you. Okay. I think you, you broke a little bit in between. Um, yeah, you are back now. Okay, thanks, Neha. <laughs> Hopefully not too much lost there, but um, just so you know, I'll, I'll, we'll be giving a written response to all of these questions as well in the, in the feedback that we give. So if you've not caught anything, my apologies. I'll make sure that you get a, a kind of written uh, written response there too.
Um, so that brings me to the end of the written questions. Thank you so much, everybody. That's a really astute set of questions. Uh, I'm sure you'll think of more um, when you kind of read through the documentation, take a look at the process and, and the fees. Um, as I say, help at goldstandard.org is a good place uh, to come to us uh, to, to get more information on those. Um, now, uh, there is also the system of putting hands up. So I'll just check if anybody has got their hands up and then I'll ask you to raise your question. Um, scroll down quickly. Uh, there's a question from Robert. Uh, so just the one question from Robert, I think. Um, let me just unmute you, Robert. Hi, so there's a question, a hand up from Robert Chong. Robert, I, I don't know if you've already put that in the in the written questions box, but... Um, oh, I, did not, I did not put a question box, uh, too many questions. Uh, I have one main thing here is that uh, we have two projects here in this region now. It's actually uh, going for the first one is one of the projects going for the third RCP. And another project is going for the second RCP. Will there be an impact to these two projects uh, in this aspect? <clears throat> yeah, thank, thanks, Robert. It's a it's an, an interesting one, actually. Somebody going for their third RCP is really interesting, actually. Um, and thanks for raising it, because we, we do want to provide stability to those guys. Um, and, and obviously, if you want to discuss in more detail privately with myself and Neha, please do feel free to, to drop us a line and we can set up a call to make sure that your, your clients are, are protected there. Uh, but the summary of that really is that if you've signed a legal agreement to provide those uh, renewals, um, uh, and that's been signed before the first of November. Um, then, then you should be, you, should, you know, from a, from your perspective, you're eligible to continue that service. There's no issue there. Um, and that's no, no. Like I'm not is. talking about uh, we continue the service. I'm talking about the project developer. Now they are walking through the end of the second RCP and also the first RCP. Will they be still allowed to continue under these new uh, requirements under the uh, goals that GSGG? That you only limit to five years plus another one more one more renewal is ten years. But based on the old requirements, they are eligible up to uh, twenty one years. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the, the them renewing, they're they're perfectly eligible to continue their renewal, um, and it's obviously that'll be going through before the first of March. So they'll be renewing under the previous version of the standard. Um, so uh, in effect, they're not actually affected right now. Um, so. For example, the project that's coming up uh, to do its second renewal uh, will be able to renew using whichever version of the standard that it's been using. Uh, and then it would transition to GS for GG at the next verification that comes after the 1st of March. So in terms of the certification renewal, there should be no impact on that project. And when they transition, they get the balance of whatever the crediting cycle that they're in. So uh, you know, presumably they're, they're seven years, that would, be, that would make sense. So I'll get the balance of that seven years in that, that crediting cycle. Then, if they come to renew again, uh, then it would it would flip to the five year cycle. Then, which I think only affects one of the two projects, the one that's at the second, the one that's entering the third certification cycle, uh, would just continue to the end of its natural life um, anyway. Um, so I don't think that would be affected at all. Um, but the second one effectively would would flip to to five years at the next transition. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robert. That's a, a good and, and and if you want to be. Um, if you want to feel really confident and you, if that's not quite answered, it, do drop us a note and I can answer that more formally. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robert. Okay, let me just mute Robert. So I'd, um, I'd imagine many of you have that kind of question uh, on your mind where you're providing a service and you want to just check um, uh, what's... Um, what the what the impact is on the project that you're serving right now so if they're coming to a certification renewal or they're verifying you know are you eligible does it disrupt uh, the principle we want to apply here is minimum disruption to everybody um, so if you're unsure please do drop us a note we're happy to take that offline i appreciate there's some commercial sensitivity as well so you might not be comfortable raising your hand here um, but do come forward with that we're very happy to help uh, clarify that situation so if you're unsure how it affects your service or a project that you're providing a service to uh, reach out to us anytime either at help at gold standard or to myself and neha who many of you will know uh, and we'll, we'll make sure our email addresses are on the um on the circulation after this webinar Okay, so looking down the list, there's no other hands up and no other written questions. I'm sure many of you will have um, things that you're mulling over and still digesting, some questions, concerns, clarifications. Like I say, we, we want to be pretty open with this, so do reach out to us when, when you're ready um, uh, and when we can, uh, we can deal with questions uh, by email. We, we're, we are recording this uh, webinar. 
Um, we are going to publish a series of FAQs as they come forward as well, uh, so that we can be consistent with what we're telling everybody. So, um, you know, but but we can keep uh, obviously anything that you're worried about from a commercial point of view. Uh, you know, bring that forward to us in a private conversation, and we obviously won't publish that for all to see. Um, and, and with that, with no, with no further questions, um, we'll draw this webinar to a close. It's, it's really fantastic to see many of you, so many of you attend. Um, you know, we, we have a huge affection and respect for our, our VVB community. And I know change is always a challenge um, to deal with, um, particularly in the short term, as you're trying to figure out how this affects the services you provide. Uh, but like I say, to assure you that we're on hand to support you and make sure that you're comfortable with uh, what you can and can't do and how it affects your projects. Um, and we look very much forward to look, look forward to seeing your applications uh, and any other ideas you might have about where gold standards for the global goals might go in the future. Uh, and with that, I'll, um, I'll end the webinar. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, and look out for a, a follow-up email from us in terms of uh, the further information, the links, the email addresses, and any FAQs that come up. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, hi, Owen. Oh, uh, before hi. we close, um, should, we, should we maybe you know, uh, say a few pointers on the, on the next training that we're having on 2nd August? Yeah, good point. Thanks, Neha. Yeah, I, I sort of briefly touched upon it earlier. But do you, want, do you want to maybe just cover that briefly for a couple of minutes, and then we'll sign out? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so as you must have, you know, seen from our, uh, you know, earlier notification emails that we are having another, you know, full technical training uh, webinar for all auditors on 2nd of August. Uh, so this is, you know, one of the mandatory trainings uh, that, you know, the auditors have to attend uh, in order to become you know, eligible uh, for GS4 or GG. Uh, so if, if if any of the, the auditors, you know, from the from your auditing firms is, is attending the, the training webinar on 2nd of August, then this information should be reflected in the application forms which you will be submitting for, for the approval. Um, so, yeah, um, so, so looking forward to seeing you all on that training webinar. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Neha. And um, yeah, that, that training webinar will be available to everybody um, and we'll obviously make sure that um, that we respond to further questions in that too. So do look out for that one and we'll be running a series of those over the year, of course, as we have historically. Um, thank you very much, Neha. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, look forward to hearing your ideas, thoughts, questions um, as well uh, following the webinar. But in the meantime, uh, thanks so much for attending and all the best. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.